I've, uh, I haven't felt so energized at a, at a conference. It was super cool when I was seeing the things like everyone, all of us jumping up and I was like, man, I'm jumping. That, that is not usually how I roll. Uh, so it's, it's, a great, it's great to be here. I'm super excited and uh, for, for a lot of reasons. But hearing so much of what was talked about this morning uh, was really a lot of actually what I want us to be able to connect on today and uh, in, this, in this workshop around scaling compassionate leadership. Since some of the principles uh, up here of the Culture Conference of being inter interactive and engaging and so on, why don't we start with an activity? Sound good? Yeah. Yeah. If we could please stand up. <clears throat> I'd like us to turn to our neighbors and just find actually groups of three. Let's do that, let's do groups of three. All right, well, and if, listen, it's all good if you gotta go to four, life goes on, no problem. So, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do a little, a little one minute activity. I'll, I'll set my little watch here, or actually I have it right here. One minute activity. And in the one minute activity, I want us to get to know each other. So everyone gets to know each other, okay? So 20 seconds each if you're three, right? 15 if you're four. And I want us to answer this one question which is, what is a quality that inspires you most about your best friend? All right. Everybody's like stoked about their best friend, gonna call them later, be like, I love you, you're amazing. <laughs> See, at this conference I was talking about you. All right, so I'd like you to look to another group and I'd like you to combine. So two of your groups combine, please. So you have a larger group. We're going to have the same 60 seconds, and we're going to answer this question. Who has been most influential in your life? Should we do one more round? Why not, right? So why don't you two groups combine, you two groups combine, and you three groups combine. And now, and now we're going to answer the question, what's one quality you love most about yourself? I know everybody's like, oh man, this is ridiculous. <laughs> do I say I'm a badass and then like, how do I, you know, like I don't want people to think I'm arrogant, but I'm kind of awesome, like I don't know. So let's, let's take a couple seconds to think about that. And we're gonna have the same 60 seconds. Little rapid round, right? So are we ready? <laughs> Go. Please. And a little round of applause for yourselves. So I'd love to know, what was the experience like for you when you started with the smaller group and then finally got to the larger group? Yes? Well, with the smaller group, we got to spend more time on each person's topic mm -hmm. and answer. But as we got to the bigger group, you know, we really had to, we tried to say a lot with very little. Yeah, yeah. Well said, yes. We all introduced ourselves to each other in the smaller group. Mm. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah? By the time I got to the larger group, it was like we were already kind of warmed up, and so we just nailed it. All right, just went, went through it. Did you, did you feel like in the smaller group, you got to know people a little bit? Yes. Yeah. A little bit harder in the larger group, right? So this, this, is, this is fundamentally, I do this activity because I think it's quite representative of what happens when an organization grows, is, you know, fundamentally, we all look for a connection, right? We all want to relate to one another. That is just fundamentally human. I mean, there are tons of studies about it, whether it's the Harvard Adult Study that talks about relationships being sort of central to our happiness and longevity, or the 150 other studies that are about deep connection. But this is challenging when you get larger in an organization, and, you know, things get busy. And so we start knowing people a lot less or we do the one word type thing, the how are you, where you're walking, hey, how you doing? You don't, you're not even listening to how you're doing, it's just, that's just kind of like the, t the term you say, right? And this fundamental lack of connection also decreases your capacity for compassion. Leah Weiss over at Stanford, who's uh, teaching a course on leading with mindfulness and compassion, is coming out with a book called Heart at Work, in which part of what she's talking about is how do you bring compassion into organizations in a purposeful and practical way 
so that you can create the conditions for organizational success. As Arden talked about earlier, you can't actually create more time, right? So how do we create that success? And we talked a little earlier uh, about some of the, 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 the frameworks of success, one of them being I, we, it, right? How many of you have seen the I, we, it framework? Great. For those of you who haven't, basically this is our relationship, and if you think about success, this is our relationship with success. The it is our relationship with a task. So if you're given a task, you're like going after it, right? You're trying to achieve that task. Or it's your relationship with a mission of your organization. At LinkedIn, we're about connecting the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. So you're connected to a mission. But then here, the I and the we is really the human dimension. This is fundamentally all about how do we connect as people with each other and with ourselves. Now what can happen in that decreased connection as an organization grows is that you start knowing yourself a little bit less, getting a little less self-aware, and then having a little less self-compassion. How many of you, how many of you, you have a list of things that you want to do, and a list of things that you must do, and you can't even complete one of those lists? And how many of you beat yourself up a little bit about that? A good amount of people, right? It's, it's, it's something, you know, people are motivated to achieve this it. But in doing so, often we actually lose a lot of the human dimension. So here's the challenge with that. Once you lose a lot of the awareness and compassion for yourself, it extends to losing awareness and compassion of others. As is evidenced by our inability to remember at what everyone's doing when an organization grows. As I mentioned earlier, that's Jim from Ops. Has anyone called someone by their function? I mean, I know I do, you know? Look, there, there's a, there is a practicality around it, right? But the challenge is, we don't actually know anything more about Jim from Ops. We just know it's Jim from Ops, right? And that's a challenge. And why is that a challenge, though? Because of two things. What I see manifest are two things. One. When you lose that fundamental level of connection and level of relating with one another, what can often happen is that you seek individual success. So you're about, what do I need? When you feel connected with others and connected with a mission, you're seeking more collective success. The second thing I see happen is that because you lose connection with each other, because you lose connection with yourself, you often lose connection with what you're actually here for. What's the purpose of what you're here for? That it. And that's challenging, right? That is really challenging because if you lose that, how can you actually achieve the organization's mission? Think about this. Any organization's mission can only be achieved by effective collaboration. Right? Can, there's no other way. Some of a bunch of people can only be achieved by effective collaboration. And effective collaboration requires that you don't just look at each other as competent in your profession, but that you can relate to one another, that you can connect to one another and feel for one another. Right? It's a, not only fundamentally what we need as humans, but really it's what we need for organizations as well. Because to achieve the organization's mission, you need this the I and the we in order to achieve that it. And so at LinkedIn, part of what we're trying to do is create a culture of compassionate leadership. And I know many of you may be trying some similar things in your orgs. Why are we talking about leaders? Well, I think Jenny may have mentioned it before, but there's, there's two reasons. One, because anybody can be a leader, right? Can be a leader. But the second is, for those who are sort of in the titles of leaders, you are the single biggest point of leverage in any organization, right? It's the only way to really scale. And unless our leaders are buying into any of these kind of things for ourselves, then we're not gonna be able to scale something in an organization. So compassionate leadership is really what we're, we're trying to create. And we're trying to do that through three methods, I would say. One is just a leader. Our leader, Jeff Weiner, many of you may know, speaks about compassionate leader, uh, leadership a bunch both internally and externally. Uh, it is, he is an amazing steward for wanting to see a world in which people have more wisdom and more compassion. And this starts in organizations. 
The second thing we're doing are more programmatic initiatives. We have a lot of programmatic initiatives going on, but I'll mention three. The first is we have an effort around belonging. And this is really, to, really our effort to actually have people feel like they can be the DNA of the organization. Why? Because if you feel like you belong, you're actually more likely to feel like, I am understood, right? People understand me and they accept me. A second set of initiatives we have going on is around mindfulness, right? Because we need to have more awareness. And I'll mention one is we have a program called Mindful, Mindful Moments, which is really about how do we bring more mindful practices, practical practices, into play with our employees to help them improve relationships, productivity, and resiliency. And then lastly, I work with a gentleman named Fred Kaufman, and we're very fortunate to have him at the organization. He wrote a book called Conscious Business. And effectively, what it is about is how can we be more mindful of ourselves and others to be able to communicate and collaborate more effectively? And he, with our awesome L&D team, has actually created a course internally. And that course is by its name, Conscious Business, which is looking to do that for all employees. And we've now taken, actually, that course and put it externally as a certification that anyone can do. So we have a bunch of people globally who are, actually, who are uh, taking this certification and emailing us a bunch about how they're able to feel like they understand themselves and each other more, right? And then the third set of initiatives that we're, we're, we're doing is, I'd say these are interventions with leadership teams. Now, this is the one I want to spend a little bit more time on because the leader and the programmatic initiatives, uh, maybe some of your organizations, you're already doing that. And maybe in some you're not. But these are, are sort of you're chipping away at it, right? The initiatives with the leadership teams I actually think can happen today. And I'd like us to actually learn some of those today. Uh, so there's a lot of initiatives. This is, a lot, this is where I spend the bulk of my time is with our leadership teams. And some of the experiments that I try are around how do we create more awareness and compassion. And so there are a lot of experiments that I've tried. Some failed. Some are, seem to be going all right. I'll mention two here. The first is I created a personal values workshop. Sounds just as simple, and it really is as simple as that. Created a personal values workshop that now I have leaders across the organization that are running on their own, even in team meetings, weekly team meetings. They'll run a little values workshop. And it's exactly as it sounds. It is about people understanding their own values and the values of their peers and stakeholders. Why? One, LinkedIn's a heavily culture and values-driven organization. And that's amazing. But imagine the power when people understand their own values, especially leaders, and understand how they lead through those values, how they make decisions through those values. And when they collaborate, how they can understand others, particularly when others have differing opinions or differing styles than they do, right? And what I found is the feedback that I get is incredible. Like, hey, I ran this session, and hey, I'm showing up better at work because I'm understanding what's driving my decisions. I'm understanding what's making me happy. I'm understanding that when I actually am unhappy, I understand why I'm unhappy when I leave work. Because every day, one of the practices we have is rate yourself one to 10 on how each of your values showed up. And what you find is 100% of the time, when you leave work frustrated, one of those values is probably below a seven, right? So this is a real way to be able to actually understand your values. And the, the, the comments I get are, the feedback I get is, I know myself better, but I also know others better. And I've had people email me saying, you know, there's someone that I really didn't like to work with that much, but I actually understand a lot more about them and why their values are such, what drives some of their values, and it helps us bridge the gap in communication. So this is a, a, a workshop that I'm doing that is something that you could take back to your organization. A second one, though, which is that what I'd love to spend some time in an activity on, is uh, I created a workshop that was all around creating micro practices of self-awareness and self-compassion. Why? Well, if we're not compassionate with ourselves, it's really difficult for us to be compassionate with others, right? Um, it's just hard. And then the second reason is, uh, how many people look at their calendar and they're like, man, I have so much time in the day, I don't even know what to do with it. It's awesome. 
Yeah, like nobody does, right? Nobody has that much time in the day. And so it's not like you're going to sit here and, you know, do two hours of some work, uh, you know, outside of the, the busy day that you have. So how can you create small practices that have compounding effects and can make some big changes pretty quickly? So that's why I created this. Now, it stemmed from a personal experience for me. Uh, I had the fortune of growing up as a competitive tennis player. Uh, I was number one in the state of Texas for six straight years. That hadn't been achieved. Uh, at my highest, I was number six in the country. Um, traveled around the world playing and uh, loved the sport. Now, I don't tell you that for you to like pat me on the back. But, but what I, what I, why I say that is because something that has stemmed from that is a bit of a mentality of, I'd say, a zero-sum mentality. You win, I lose. Because I view sort of how I, view, how I did with tennis as, oh, I lost. I don't play anymore, right? So I may have lost. Hey, Roger Federer's playing at 35. I'd love to. You know? So I view it a little bit like that. Now, I didn't know that I viewed it as a zero-sum mentality, but I was uh, clued into it by one of my best friends. So my, one of my best buds, Kevin, 10 years ago, uh, we were at a bar. And I should explain a little bit about Kevin. So Kevin is probably someone who is not He's the stereotype of a dude who's not that emotional. Uh, I've never heard him describe his emotions to me. In fact, when he had his kid, he called me. Uh, when I had my kid, I was crying. I was like super excited. It was amazing. I was like, this is the best thing ever. And he called me, and uh, he was like, hey, man, we had our kid. <laughs> that was exactly how he said it. I was like, that's amazing. He was like, yeah, it's cool. <laughs> so that's a little context of Kevin. So we're at a bar. We're having a beer, and he... Uh, you know, he's kind of quiet, and then he says, uh, hey, Prakash, uh, I want to mention something to you. He's like, I feel a little weird saying this, but he was like, I know, I know you mean very well. He was like, and I know you want good for people. Um, but I have to tell you, at times, I feel like you're not actually that concerned about things going on in my life. And sometimes it makes it hard for me to trust that you would be there in a time of need for me. And... Um, knowing Kevin now, like you do, uh, it must have been on his mind for a while, right? And it must have been something that, that was eating at him that he felt very uh, challenged to say. And it crushed me. It absolutely crushed me. And it crushed me for two reasons. One, that would never be my intent. Uh, my mission is to help create collective success, to help people recognize and achieve their potential by bridging gaps between where they are now and where they want to be. And I would love to see a broader group of people be successful, as opposed to the same set of people that are always successful. That's always what I've wanted to see. Clearly, sometimes that message doesn't land, or sometimes my energy outward doesn't land like that. The second reason I was uh, crushed was I thought that there was probably a smidgen of truth to that. Now, I wouldn't intentionally do that, but I did know that at times I get emotionally hijacked, as probably many of us do. And I get emotionally hijacked about all sorts of random things, but I would notice that at times when I get emotionally hijacked, I'm just not present for myself nor for others. And, but because one of my best buds said it it, it, like, it stung. And so I was like, I have to figure out what's going on. And so I ended up, I won't bore you with all the details, but I ended up trying three things, basically. I ended up, A, trying to understand what is triggering me to get emotionally hijacked, right? Or what, when, when I get emotionally hijacked, what are the triggers? And I found, for myself at least, that the triggers were something as simple as somebody talking about someone's success. And even if it was something I never did, I'd be like, man, I'm not doing enough. I'm going to lose. I'm going to lose. It was just like sort of comparison, right? Which I, I know I'm not totally alone in, but, you know, uh, nevertheless, that's how I was feeling. And it wasn't malintent to someone else. I'm happy when someone else does something. But fundamentally, I was like, I'm going to lose. Then I had to understand, second, <clears throat> what is the story that I'm telling myself? Jim Lair says, the most important story you, you tell is a story you tell yourself about yourself. And I love that. Because the story I was telling myself about myself is that life is a zero-sum game, and I'm on the losing end. And that sucks. Uh, 
you know, I've, I've led a very, I'm very grateful for the life I've led. I'm very privileged and, uh, and happy to be where I'm at. But to have that thought going on and that story, that tape playing, it's not a good feeling, right? Can anybody relate to things like that? Yeah, a few of us can, right? So uh, I was like, okay, well, how do I address it? So then the third thing I had to figure out, how am I going to address it? And what I realized was I tried a bunch of things, and there were a bunch of things in the category of fad diet or fad workout. Let me get jacked before the beach, beach season, right? And I'm going to do it like I'm going to eat like crap the rest of the year, but let me get jacked before beach season. That wasn't exactly working because of our calendar issues, right? And so I was like, how do I create small practices each day that maybe just over time can be sustainable shifts? And so what I found was you could do a lot of things. So uh, Leah, who I mentioned at Stanford, in, in her book, what she, part of what she talks about is just taking a couple of deep breaths and recognizing that you are suffering and that you're not alone in that suffering. And I tried that, and it was helpful. But what I've found in doing this with myself and now working with a bunch of leaders is that if you can find the practice that suits you and resonates for you, it's even more important. And the practice for me, when I get triggered, is I ask myself a simple question. What's the world I want to see? And I ask myself that question because the world I want to see is one where everyone's winning, right? And I include myself in that bucket, but I want others to win. And that's the world I want to see. And so when I can ask myself that question, I may still be triggered, and I may feel a little bit of that bubbling anxiety, but I won't get to being emotionally hijacked so I can stay more present and in the moment. Now, I tell you these three things for three reasons. One, this is a framework I'd love us to use in our activity. Two, uh, this shift I don't think takes a whole lot of time. So if day one I was trying to figure out what my triggers were and I was triggered 10 out of 10 times, by day three I was triggered 9 out of 10 times because I had a, a phrase or a, the question that I would ask myself. By day seven, it was more like seven out of 10 times. And then by week three, it was five out of 10 times. And I know that because I literally tallied every day. I tallied everything every day. And that's how I roll. Uh, I, like, <laughs> uh, I like measuring it. So three weeks in, five out of 10 times. So you could see change pretty quickly. Now, was it perfect? No. Do I still get triggered? Absolutely. But it's more like one or two out of 10 times now that I actually feel like I get emotionally hijacked. And so I wanted to bring this to our, to our leaders. And hopefully, my hope here is that we could do this activity for ourselves here. Why? Again, because you are leaders. And if you bring this back to your organizations and start with yourself, Maybe it's of service to others if you find this useful for yourself. So are we good with doing that activity? Yeah. All right. Um, I want to thank you up front for doing it, though, because I recognize we're in a group of, uh, of folks that some we may not know, right? Uh, but as, as Jenny said, I forgot the exact quote, but the uh, you know, stranger is someone who is a, a friend you haven't met yet, right? So uh, if we can actually bask in our shared human experience, uh, then I think we can actually make this pretty successful. And so we're going to do this in two forms. One, we're going to uh, do a little bit of reflection on our own. So you all have your workbooks, right? So in your workbooks, I'm going to ask us for a little bit of reflection. And then I'd like us to get up and do an activity with each other to leverage the collective wisdom of this group. Cool? So there are three questions I'm going to ask that I, I'd like you to reflect on for a few minutes. The first is, what situations trigger you to beat yourself up? The second is, what's the story you're telling yourself? And the third is, what are micro practices of self-compassion that you can create that resonate for you, that could be helpful? I'm sorry? The last one is, what are micro practices of self-compassion that you can create? So just, I'm going to give you about three to four minutes just to reflect on your own. Yes? Is number two about number one? Yes, great question.
Love it. Number two is about number one. What's the story you're telling yourself when you get triggered? When you get emotionally hijacked, what's that story you're telling yourself? If anyone's having any challenges, think about those situations where perhaps you're in a meeting and somebody says something and you get really uh, emotional. Or if you're in a particular situation, like in a particular place, a physical setting in which you get triggered. Out of curiosity, how was that experience, right, and that reflecting that for you on, on your own? Or reflecting on that? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I have about seven of them. <laughs> uh, sorry. So she said she had an experience in that uh, things trigger her differently. So she'll have to have different micro practices. And I, I, I love that. Sorry. Go ahead. Awesome. Thank you. Yes? Um, it's helpful for me to locate the, the emotional feeling or the physical feeling and then ask myself, well, what's causing that to happen? Mm. So I kind of began there and then name the conditions that were triggering me. Awesome. Thank you. Yes? Huh. Mm. Yeah. I, I love that, Eric. Uh, uh, he just said he found that the story he was telling himself is a motivator, and I don't think that's untrue. I mean, I, I, I tend to think that uh, a general philosophy is that there's really good and bad, there's really right and wrong, but most things live in a space between where they serve you to some degree and they don't serve you to some degree, right? So I can completely understand where there are places in which it serves you. The question is, are there places in which it doesn't serve you? And how do we think about that? I love that there. That's great. Yeah. Yes? So I found, I found it uh, really easy to come up with the triggers mm -hmm. and the story I'm telling myself, but struggle more with where those things are getting from Awesome. So yeah. 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 Well, you know that's why we got the wisdom of the crowd. So we'll uh, we'll, we'll get you some. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. It's like the choice you're saying to, to control. Yeah. Well, it's it's all about right. I mean, you can't control some external things. Mm-hmm. Sure. So if you're letting something else or someone else control you, that means that you're not truly expressing it confidently. Hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the story is uh, go ahead. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and this is, I think, it's so great that you bring this up because uh, it really, I find there are probably really standard practices that can be helpful. Like, I think everybody probably does some form of deep breathing at some point, right? And it's super helpful. The question is, I think, when you are telling yourself a story, does that story shift if you're not actually doing something that resonates uh, particularly for you? Um, and at least what I found is that a lot of the people I work with, it needs to resonate for them. Um, cool. Well, let's, yes, please. Along those lines, I was in a counseling practice when we were able to locate the trait of something, an emotion comes up, which again comes usually from the ego center itself. We locate in our body, mm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I think as leaders, uh, part of the reason we focus on this is as leaders, have you, have you ever heard leaders be like, well, my team doesn't do X, Y, and Z, or I don't know. They, don't, they need to learn how to do blah, blah, blah. And it's like, my question is always like, do you do blah, blah, blah? <laughs> I mean, the likelihood is no. So why the heck would they do anything, right? And so I think if we start with leaders, you know, if we're trying to create a compassionate culture, we have to define it, and then we have to demonstrate it ourselves before we can demand it. And so let's do a little activity then. Let's do a little feed forward exercise. Has anyone done a feed forward exercise? Cool, yeah, a couple people have, all right. It's quite simple. It's, we're gonna do it in, pairs and we'll move around, but we'll be, my name is Prakash. The story I tell myself is, life is a zero-sum game and I'm on the losing end. <laughs> and I get triggered when I read or about success or people talk about success. And then partner, I'd like you to say thank you for sharing and suggest one micro practice, right? Something quite small that you think just may be helpful to them. Now, this is a smart crew. This is not the time for you to be smart, <laughs> okay? Like, no, no need for you to be, you know, doing two-by-twos here, you know, where you're like, yeah, you need to be in the upper right-hand corner. No. <laughs> just, you know, just, just, just feel the other person out and be able to give them just a small suggestion. Now, equally, if you're on the receiving end, right, if you're on the receiving end, this is not a time for you to be like, you know, I like that. The thing about that is, the problem is, I'd try that, but, you know, actually that doesn't work for me. No, just say thank you. <laughs> That's it, thank you. Switch, right? Thank you, switch, you become the person who's actually listening and get to give a micro practice, all right? And then when you're finished, I'd like you both to raise your hand and find someone else that's raising their hand so that we can actually get a lot of suggestions from people, right? Because we may have some that actually, it's hard to find your own micro practice. Sometimes we're in our head a lot, right? So, we good with this? All right, well let's stand up and start it. All right, let's bring it back, team. All right. How was that? All right, all right. Dig it. Tell me a little bit more. <laughs> so we got a lot of practice. Go ahead. People are so wise. I love that. Awesome. Wise people. Yes. Manisha. Yes. I very much also appreciate uh, the, the practice, and what I love about that is that we're able to express our vulnerability in a very radical, honest, and authentic way, which is not necessarily <laughs> something our culture encourages that much, and especially in you know corporate settings, sometimes people are afraid to share vulnerability because they feel that the other person gets a competitive advantage, and so I think this is really key here, and, and I just personally very much enjoy. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, please. I felt like when I named the story and the fear, it felt a little less important. Like saying it out loud, I was like, oh, why do I think that about myself? That seems silly. But in my head, it's like, oh, that's real. That's real. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yes, please. Um, I was really attracted to the way that this human connection promotes belonging. So yeah. there's this mutuality of like, oh, I've been seen, but then also you get this sense of like, oh, we're all in this together. Yeah. This is a shared human experience we're all dealing with, right? We are all in the shared human experience. And wouldn't it be better if we recognized that we were all more similar than we are different? How do you create, how do you, you know, you create a lot more collective success if you can recognize that we are more similar than we are different. And that's incredibly important. So I'm going to ask us, you got a lot of practices that were suggested to you. I'd like you to pick one that you're going to do for the next two weeks. Can you do that? Will you do that? All right. So how many people will do that? Okay. Okay, for those of you raising your hand, take out your phones. Because <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where like everyone's like, yeah, I'll do it. I forget about it in the next session, right? And then, like, never really happens. So take out your phones, and I'd like you to pick the practice you're going to do, and in your calendars, at 5 p.m. every day for the next two weeks at least, I'd like you to ask the question, how many times did I use my micro practice today? And by the way, that calendar invite should uh, have a reminder. Oh, yeah. No, uh, I don't, is there another one like that? <laughs> but like, it pings you up. Well, yeah, ask me every. Awesome. Love that. <laughs> yeah. Love that. Thank you, Amy. Yes. So something, go ahead. There's an assumption here, right, that like, I'm triggered during the day. There is an yeah, there is an assumption, but so if, I'm not if you're not, you could do it at any, you could do it at, uh, at any given time that, that works for you. My point is more creating consistency around something that does trigger you. Um, and if you have, you mentioned a few different triggers, so maybe, maybe you pick one. And the reason I'm asking you to pick one is twofold. Uh, one. I think you just want to have one practice and try that on. It may not be perfect. You try something else. It's all good. Life goes on. You know, uh, this is not a right and wrong thing, right? The second reason is, I think one of the challenges that happens is we try on too many things, right? I got to change all of these things all at the same time. And no, you don't. Like nobody's asking you to do that by yourself, right? So if we can just try on one thing at a time, we are more likely to actually have that build, right? Cool, everybody did that with their phone, all right. So look, I, I, I really, you know, I love this quote, which is like, our human compassion is what binds us to one another, not in pity or patronizingly, but as human beings who've learned how to turn our common suffering into hope for the future. And I recognize that this is really about life, but as I think about business and our organizations, fundamentally it's about people. There's no such thing as an organization in the absence of people. So if we can recognize this shared human experience and relate to one another, we are not only going to be happier and more engaged as people with ourselves and with others, but we are going to help our organizations have the impact that we're trying to, right? And it starts with leaders. It really does. 
It's the biggest leverage point. And I think as leaders, if we can be more vulnerable, at least starting with ourselves, it actually allows us to connect with our uh, teams better, peers, and up, right? Cool? Thank you. Any, I'm sorry, go, any questions? I mean, yeah? Quarters, yeah. I love that that question. I mean, look, I, frankly, I, I don't know what the answer, if I knew what the answer is, believe me, it would be a lot, lot different conversation going on. But here, here is, here's at least how I would think about that. I don't think it's about only people or only product, though. There is some balance. The question is, what is the balance, in my mind? And uh, what I think more often happens is, because uh, product can be tangible, right? Or you know, if you think about uh, market share or, or uh, you know, mitigating risk or risk, uh, mitigating risk, uh, if you think about a lot of what we end up doing is mitigating uncertainty, right? So you think about the markets, financial markets, you're mitigating uncertainty. You think about financial reporting, you're mitigating uncertainty, right? A lot of what we end up doing is mitigating uncertainty. And it's a lot easier to do that as it pertains to timelines of product and, and, uh, and, and such. I'm not saying that, that it is easy, but it's a lot easier to do that than think about right now when I say let's be compassionate towards ourselves and others. It's, it's a lot harder to quantify uh, in, in the simplest form. And I think it's a lot harder to actually direct that to uh, uh, the, the, the product and revenue. And so from my, my perspective, I think there has to be a first, as a leader at an executive level, a fundamental belief that I'm willing to try this on. I'm willing to try it on. And I think the micro practices are a lot better than trying on something major, right? So I'm willing to try it on for myself. And if I experience some benefit from it, then I may actually shift a little bit more to understanding that it is more beneficial to be compassionate. It is more beneficial to be conscious. And it actually does help our organizations. So I don't have a magic bullet, but what I, what I would say is I, think, I do think that starting small is better than massive initiatives to try and overhaul. Um, I think we have to have leaders say, does this, does this, do I buy into it first? And if I don't, I don't think that that's a group we need to be spending time with. The spending time with are the people who are bought in and then the people on the fence who are willing to try, right? That, that population we start with. And then the idea would hopefully be that we could actually get those folks influencing the folks who are not bought in. I don't know if that's a great answer to your question, but it's a thought. Hmm. Yeah? So earlier you mentioned you love measuring. How are you measuring the impact of these micro-practices? Yeah, great question. Great, great question. So uh, over the last couple of years, I started more with actually just feedback. What I'm trying to now is actually focus even within our sales organization because that's closest to revenue. Uh, I'm trying to uh, measure uh, in a way how do some of these practices, if people are actually engaged in tallying their practices, what are those, what are those uh, uh, outcomes? Now, there are multiple initiatives going on at any given time, right? So how can you attribute it to just one thing? That is very hard. But if we have, okay, revenue was X, revenue is X plus 3%, and these are the four initiatives going on, and I'm the leader, and I say, this initiative has actually helped me, I at least think that I have a higher probability of being able to convince others that that is actually measurable than I do if I haven't tallied anything, if I haven't actually uh, uh, tried to measure it. So I actually ask at least the leaders that I'm working it that they have to measure it, otherwise we don't work together. So 
And it works sometimes and it doesn't work other times. It's, I'll tell you what, I mean, I'm sure I could get a lot of great ideas from you all on how, how, how to do this, but what I'm trying now is we engage if we can have these ground rules or these norms so that we can actually understand what before and after looks like. Yeah, um, I've found, at least in, in, in my experience, I've found that people have to have personal experiences to, I mean, it's why I kind of start with, with this group with this, because uh, in the absence of that, I've found that either they have personal experiences or it's referred to them by someone who they highly value. Um, and so I, I, I start there. But it's no secret that now that there are more people coming out saying they are conscious leaders and they are, I mean, look, we have magazines about it, right? Uh, uh, there are more people coming out and saying that and are seeing value out of it. And I do think uh, to the gentleman's question in the back, like how that can actually start to create more of a movement that way. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. The, the, the way I've approached it, I'd say, is probably twofold. I've spent 80% of my time with people who uh, are bought in, meaning they've, they, they have been open to talking about it. Uh, why? Because that's the population that I think I have to start with. Um, I'd say I spend another 10% of my time with the people who are maybe on the fence, meaning they're like, this is cool stuff. Sure, I love that you do this woo-woo stuff, man. It's cool. I mean, I love you. You're a good dude, but like, uh, sure. And, and what, I, what I try to do is ask them something as simple as this. Uh, I take some of the feedback that maybe I've been given to them in a coaching conversation that I've been given, and I ask them what happened. And I ask them what they can do to change that. And they'll give me the laundry list of things that they could do. And I ask them to do one thing that takes less than 30 seconds and we check back in in two weeks. And I'd say eight times out of 10, I find somebody saying, wow, that little thing worked. For example, you know, uh, recently I was working with someone who often is heavily sort of, I guess, triggered by when somebody asks him for time and he's in the middle of something, he's like, oh my God, this is crazy, I don't have time for you. So what happens is a lot of the trust is eroded with his, uh, with his group. And so what we've implemented is a simple pause. Like he has to actually say the word pause three times. Sounds silly, right? But it's funny, in a matter of two weeks, he was like, man, I feel like actually I know how to do this now a little bit. It's great. That to me is an opening. Um, and then the 10% uh, uh, of the rest of the time are people who, if it comes up, I'm willing to connect with them on it, but I don't find that the best use of time, personally. Uh, so, so the question is, do you find some teams who buy into it and their leader does or doesn't? Or? Uh, so I've made up that there's probably a mix of sure. people who buy into it, people who don't, and within the whole organization, culturally, mm -hmm. um, there may be some teams that don't have leaders who are, who are doing yeah. this. Yeah, uh, well, we have the very good fortune, at least, of, uh, of Jeff being our CEO, who's a big endorser of compassionate leadership. So I think that that really does make a massive difference when your leader is, is, uh, is about it. I mean, it, 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 it creates a foundation for being able to use that language is not just something that's like, oh, that's cool. It's like, oh, yeah, that's a must. So that makes a difference. Um, but we do have a mix, I mean, just like any other company. Yeah? He always remembered my name. Yeah. He always took an interest in what I was doing, what I was doing. 
Awesome. Yeah. I know we're over time, but thank you for, uh, for joining here. I really appreciate it. Thank you.